One, Barry, over to you. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to our weekly COVID-19 media briefing with Montgomery County Executive Mark Elrich, also our health officer, Dr. Travis Gales, and Dr. Earl Stoddard, who is the director of the Office of Emergency Management and Homeland <coughs> Security for Montgomery County Government. I'm Lorna Vigili, Hispanic Public Information Officer, and I believe members of the media, you already have access, permission to record. If you have not received it, ask in the chat to get your permission, and we will also use the chat for the Q&A portion of this presentation. And with that, to you, Mr. County Executive. Hey, thank you very much, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, I'll start, you know, in the bright spot in the in COVID right now is our cases per 100,000 um, have fallen to 12.79, which is the lowest since November 4th. <clears throat> and our positivity rate is about 3.58. And in addition to that, Montgomery County reported its smallest daily increase uh, yesterday, 91, since October 20th, when 94 cases were reported. Uh, today, we have 107 cases. The numbers are encouraging, but uh, they're not numbers we want to get comfortable with and no reason to stop doing all the things that we've been doing. Uh, the numbers are coming down. We have seen, you know, a good increase, good decrease in the numbers. Um, but we've also been really protective about how we open things up and county residents have been pretty good about mask wearing and physical distancing. So, you know, it's our behavior, which is making it possible for these numbers to go down. Uh, in terms of perspective, um, our positivity rate is about where it was in the better part of the summer toward the end of July, early August maybe. Uh, our cases per 100,000 are still a couple of multiples of where our numbers were back then. And so cases of 94 are, you know, more than we, when we were reporting 40 or 45 cases a day. So we know this is still higher than it was when we made decisions to open. Obviously, um, we're looking carefully at these numbers. If we continue to see a sustained downward trend, if we can uh, sustain a good floor again, then we'll be talking about um, moving toward being able to reopen things. We are constantly discussing um, what are the points when we can um, make some different decisions than we've made right now. Uh, testing is one of the things we focused on throughout the pandemic, at least from the point the tests were available. Unfortunately, our testing numbers have declined since mid-January. This is a national phenomenon, and I wanna please encourage people to continue to get tested. We need to know where the virus is in the community. Uh, the more testing we can do, the better able for us to identify hotspots in the county and get a sense of um, what, what the risk is of community spread. So it's really important we map this stuff out um, so that data is important in helping us devise strategies that will keep these numbers going in the direction that I know everybody would like them to travel in. Um, last week, we tested about 5,600 people. That number is down significantly uh, for the numbers that we're seeing at the end of 2020 and the beginning of the year. Um, so we really are hoping we can push those test numbers um, back up where they should be. Uh, and people need to realize just because there's a vaccine does not mean that testing isn't needed. Uh, it's very important. So please don't confuse the vaccine with a green light not to get tested. We want you to continue to get tested. On the vaccine front, the percentage of county residents who received the first dose has nearly doubled in two weeks. According to the Maryland Health Department, as of this morning, 10.6 of county residents, 10.6 percent of county residents have received the first dose and um, 3.4 have received the second dose. The county has the highest number of the people of, we have the highest number of people in the state who've received the first dose of vaccine. And this is a collective effort of the hospitals, the pharmacies, and our local health department. Um, we also have a long way to go. The supply of the vaccine is still not enough to meet high demand. The state has seen some increase in the vaccine, but that increase is not being passed along to either um, county health departments, and in some cases, even to the hospitals. They seem to be focusing on mass vaccination sites. Um, they've located several of them around the state. They have not put one in Montgomery County. 
we've asked for it. We have a location identified um, where people said we could use their property for a mass vaccination site. So we're ready for it if they want to provide it to us. Um, Prince George's County has a mass vaccination site, and I think almost half of the people they vaccinated over there the last time were actually Montgomery County residents. So um, if we're going to have mass vac sites, they need to be more spread out uh, throughout the state. And my concern is that the state should use its additional supply, which has increased, rather than taking it from county health departments. Our health department continues to be the one place that's focused on vaccinating people over the age of 75 and vaccinating the 1A group, which were the front-facing health workers and public safety workers. So every time our number gets diminished, the guarantee that those many doses will be um, put into the same people is lost. And if we want to get the group 75 and older vaccinated sooner than later, then we have to have a steady supply of vaccine that can be dedicated to that. Our focus has been on protecting the most vulnerable in the community. And uh, so far we can estimate about 43% of our estimated 75 plus population has been vaccinated so far. The county health department is not vaccinating people who are 65 to 74. Residents who are in this age group, as well as educators, should look to schedule their appointments through the hospital or pharmacies that are offering vaccines in the county or one of the state-run mass vaccination sites. Um, this is important when we continue to have, and the state is still trying to fix their software. They've had a couple of false starts. They're running another beta test today. But until their software is fixed, um, we're getting people who who are not eligible registering on the county site for vaccines and we don't have any way to stop them for registering and the only thing we can do is when they show up and they identify as being under 75 we turn them away and if we don't turn them away then we're going to reduce our supply that's available to the seniors so if you're in this age group there are other places you can go to get vaccinated if there's if you're a teacher there are other places you can go. The sooner we can focus our, our doses on the 75 plus group, the sooner our doses will be able to turn to work on the other groups that need to get vaccinated. But there are more doses outside the county health department right now than inside the health department, about um, possibly up to 10,000 doses going to other private providers compared to the 4,500 we're getting. So there are doses out there. You have to be patient. Um, there is no single registration system or scheduling system. And so this is very haphazard. Again, we've asked the state to simplify registration and to simplify scheduling. There's no reason there couldn't be a single site that a person can go into and register with available appointments. Um, but the county has no ability to do this. I can't require um, pharmacies and hospitals to vaccine any particular vaccinate any particular group of people. I can't require them to um, to schedule through the state since the state has not made that available, and so this is going to continue to be chaotic until the state uh, fixes their scheduling system and appointment system, so that there's a way to bring some order to this. Um, I understand the frustration of people. I. You know, I haven't gotten vaccinated yet um, because I feel like because I'm not most at risk, the people who are ahead of me should get vaccinated. But if you're in those high risk categories and you are going on every single day trying to get registered for, for a vaccine, um, I, I absolutely understand how challenging that has to be. There are 300,000 of you competing every week for about 15,000 doses in the county and because people not listening carefully enough to the governor think that everybody's eligible and therefore there are vaccines, you're trying to get slots that don't exist. Again, the, the state scheduling has not guaranteed us or our partners regular high numbers of doses that we can guarantee that we can schedule three and four weeks out. If the scheduling system gets fixed and if the state says that we've got three weeks at least 
of 4,500 doses, we will schedule the three weeks. And we're asking them to continue the 4,500 beyond the three weeks. The longer we know that we've got vaccine, the longer we can schedule people in advance. And I think a lot of people would like to hear from us and hear us say that we can get you scheduled now. Even if it's not tomorrow, at least you know that you're in the line and you're going to get scheduled at a date certain. Um, this, again, requires some changes in the state system. But when it's there, we will accommodate it, and hopefully this will happen sooner than later. Um, people who don't have access to the county website uh, need, and need help pre-registering are advised to call the county's vaccine pre-registration pre assistance line. The line is available seven days a week, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., and the assistance number is 240-777-2982. This line is to assist people who are having trouble with pre-registration online or don't have access to a computer. This line is not the place to call with questions about where to get vaccine. If you know somebody 65 or older that does not have a computer, please help them register. Uh, particularly in our Black and Latino communities. Again, you know, we've said this before, they have been the hardest hit by the virus and they are lagging behind in terms of getting vaccinated. There are historical reasons for that. There are technological reasons for that. Uh, but all that said, we have to do everything we can to help make sure that these folks can get vaccinated and get vaccinated soon. We're in a very tough time. The process of pre-registering and trying to find available vaccine is confusing and frustrating. I totally understand what you all are feeling and we are really working to correct it. We are ready to do this. We stand ready to give more doses. We stand ready to stand up our a mass vaccination site. site. Um, we will work, continue to work with the state and as they provide more opportunities, we will provide those opportunities to residents in the county. Um, and I thank you for being patient. And I'll just reiterate what I said before. If you get a link, don't share it. P please don't share it. All it's doing is creating chaos at the vaccination sites and it's frustrating people. And we've got seniors who need to get vaccinated who wind up not being able to get vaccinated. And we get people who aren't eligible yet and they're getting vaccinated. So work through the channels that can vaccinate you according to where you are in the priority group and let the county focus on the 75-year-olds. For now, we assure you that as soon as that's done, those 4,500 doses will be turned to everybody else in the county. Um, so with that, I'll pass it on to Dr. Gales. Good afternoon, everybody, and happy Wednesday. And as always, I hope you and your families are staying safe, staying sane, and as best as possible, staying stress-free. Uh, uh, I do want to make a couple of comments before we take questions. Uh, I want to emphasize what the county executive uh, referenced in terms of the numbers of our cases as evidence of our community transmission levels. The numbers are improving, and the trends are moving in the right direction, and they are consistent, even though ours are moving a little bit quicker than, than other jurisdictions, but they are consistent with what we're seeing across the country in terms of new cases. That does give us a sense of optimism, don't get us wrong, but at the same time, we are cautiously optimistic to continue to see if those trends are sustained, as well as if those trends are sustained um, in the setting of better weather, we, you know, the, the winter storms are keeping folks at home and cutting down on some of the transmission potentially, as also in the setting of potentially increasing uh, percentages of those who are covered by the vaccine, as well as the other point, we are continuing to monitor the presence of variant strains, as the county executive mentioned, uh, variant strains within our community and across the country that have the potential to be transmitted and spread much quicker and faster than the novel strain that was introduced into our communities almost a year ago today. So we will continue to monitor, we will continue to focus on that, and we will look to explore over the coming weeks if those uh, trends hold and continue to move in a positive direction, um, how we can potentially um, alter any of the restrictions that we have in place. Now, as if you think back to where we were in the summer, we took a very cautious approach that led to us to having much lower numbers than other jurisdictions across the state and the region. 
And we will take a similar approach in terms of being very careful and thoughtful uh, in terms of how we move forward with reopening in any capacity. Because it's important to emphasize that we don't want to open things up and have those numbers rebound, particularly in the setting of, of different variant strains that are present. We also want to level set expectations for those in the community that, for example, some of those activities that may be reopened may be reopened with some provisions, such as requiring face coverings to be worn during those activities, at least for the short term future. So please stay tuned. Please continue to know that we are following those trends and following the best practices that are happening not only in our state but across the country. We are, I do want to make an update related to, uh, speaking of weather, related to, related to uh, potential vaccine sites tomorrow. We are working feverishly to uh, make some determinations related to that and hope to be able to put information out uh, related to if we need to cancel clinics tomorrow and what types of contingency plans would be put into place. So please stay tuned. Uh, we hope to put out some information in the very near future related to that and provide guidance guidance to our residents at home. We obviously want to get everybody vaccinated, but we also want to make sure that we do it safely um, and it's safe for everybody who's staffing the clinics as well as those who are coming in for the vaccine. We continue to promote equity and access, fair and equal access, as the county executive mentioned, in terms of how we are rolling out our allotments. We continue to explore opportunities to bring the vaccine to community settings. And we have, per the state uh, requirements, we have been providing some doses to child care workers through our Dennis Avenue site, as well as providing vaccines to different independent living facilities across the county that were not included in the federal state partnership. So we're getting doses out and we're working to diversify the network of opportunities that people have access to. And we do encourage those, again, who are eligible to pre-register so that we have your information and we can provide you access to the links uh, that are available. I will stop there. I'm sure there are other questions. Turn the floor over to Dr. Stoddard, but happy to address any questions you may have. Thank you. Gales, um, welcome back, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us again. Just a couple things I want to note. Um, uh, in our 75 plus population, we're about to cross the 50% mark. Just to give you an update on where we're at, we're 48.3% uh, of our 75 and older population across the county who have received a first dose. Uh, and obviously, you know, we want to get further into that group before we move into other parts of the 1B uh, phase. Just to give you some context where we're at. The other big point thing I want to point out is that we do, you know, obviously with indoor dining opening on Sunday, we had inspection teams out. I'm happy to report that we did not find any violations nor issue any warnings or citations from the weekend activities. And so obviously that's something we're hoping to continue with our indoor dining. And as Dr. Gales and the county executive alluded to, we'll continue to evaluate how how that, you know, the level of openness that we have in the county moving forward and, and we'll continue to inspect and educate and enforce accordingly. Uh, obviously, we're, you know, this is a partnership. Obviously, you know, as we see more businesses doing the right thing and, and following the rules and, and able to keep things uh, safe, obviously, it encourages us also to be able to do additional openings. And so we appreciate the support that we've gotten from our business community thus far. So I will stop there. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gales, Mr. County Executive, and Dr. Stoddard. And uh, let's uh, begin with the uh, questions and answers portion of this presentation. First, uh, you, Chris Gordon. I believe you have questions for everybody. Chris Gordon, NBC4. Yes, um, <clears throat> excuse me. We all know that last Thursday there were long lines and waits at Richard Montgomery High School. Uh, <clears throat> some people who were supposed to be in line uh, for whatever reason, 75 plus or healthcare workers uh, told me they had to wait two, two and a half hours um, in the cold. Uh, today I went by and it was moving very well. People had only the highest regard, said it was 40 minutes to an hour, and uh, they thought it worked real well, really well. Uh, did you make any changes? Uh, are, you know, is, have you done anything differently are you improving the situation to avoid the kind of disaster that happened last Thursday? Chris, thank you for your question. As we discussed in our briefing last Thursday, the disaster last week was not caused by the way the operation was run. It was caused by lots of people showing up who were not eligible to get the vaccine. 
both in terms of who were using a link that was not appropriate, as well as bad information that was put into the community that stated that the site was an open vaccine site. So what caused the significant delays were those two factors. And so we have, again, emphasized to folks how the process works and how it moves uh, through. Uh, in every situation, except with the exception of that day, we have not experienced a situation where we've had extensive wait periods and folks standing outside in, in, for long periods of time in line. Uh, and I would like to commend the team on that day that included the uh, HHS staff and others who assisted in delivering the vaccines, as well as our colleagues from MCPD who helped diffuse some of that situation and help with crowd control, is the team actually vaccinated over 1,900 folks that day. And so in spite of those different challenges, we were able to vaccinate a significant amount of people. And also for any individuals who were scheduled to get their vaccine that day, we certainly apologize for that. And if you've had any challenges getting rescheduled or have not been able to be rescheduled, as we did make attempts to prioritize getting those folks in this week, please let us know so that we can get you back in and we can get your vaccine and you won't have to stand outside and wait in line. I would only add, uh, Chris, I think it's an important context that Dr. Yales gave it. I think the public health team, you know, you know there, there was a lot of lines, there was lines on that Thursday, but in total on Thursday, we vaccinated almost 4,200 county residents, which uh, I went back and looked, is actually more than nine health departments across the state had done combined for all their days in vaccination. And so it goes to show how many doses that did go out that day in spite of some of those challenges, not I think we all agree that we would not, we do not want to see lines like that. And I think part of the state uh, update to their system will help correct many of the issues that led to those lines. But at the end of the day, um, that was our most successful in terms of actual putting doses out to people into people's arms day that we've had since the beginning of this event. All right, next, Tom Fitzgerald, Fox 5 DC. Tom. Thank you for uh, doing the call. It's good to see all of you again. Uh, question question about schools. A, a lot of us got a news release yesterday from the Montgomery County Education Association, um, which says in part that they were um, passing a lack of confidence resolution. Uh, quote, the current MCPS plan to reopen schools facilities cannot be successfully implemented, requiring more resources, more people, more space, and more time without negatively impacting students' learning experience. Um, this is for Dr. Gales and the county executive. Um, understanding, you know, what you just said about not wanting to open things up and have things rebound, I guess the, the, the simple question is, are they right? Um, is the plan uh, that's been presented uh, in a position to not be successfully implemented? I can speak from a health perspective. I, I, I'm not a privy to those conversations between, you know, union and, and MCPS and so forth. What I can say is this, is that the guidance that we have provided continues to be the same and is consistent with the metrics and measures that we put out in the fall uh, using the state guidelines as well as the CDC guidelines in terms of metrics and markers where we thought would be safe to come back uh, related to test positivity and community transmission rate as evidenced by case rates. Um, and the numbers that we have are moving in that direction, um, which is favorable. What's also different now than, than before, which again, I, I continue to emphasize is that we are seeing teachers and education staff get vaccinated and have access to that. I do think it is important for them to be able to have access to at least one shot before going back into the classroom. I know some may say that that's controversial given some of the CDC guidance, but I do think uh, we should you know, continue to ensure that they have access to that as an added layer of protection when they go into the classroom. Uh, based upon uh, Dr. Stoddard and I have spent, we meet regularly with our colleagues at MCPS, uh, and based upon the tremendous amount of work that they have put into planning and, you know, coming up with different provisions and safety measures to put into the classroom to mitigate transmission, you know, we we feel that they've, they've done their due diligence in that and, and to continue to refine. Now that said, I think, you know, anyone should be concerned, you know, going back into work person to person, but, you know, we do feel that they have, have put a lot of, of effort in terms of coming up with different contingency plans and safety measures to mitigate transmission as much as possible. Um, and we will certainly continue to 
again, we don't make those decisions. So again, for everybody at home, the health department does not make the decisions whether or not schools open. Uh, but we will continue to, again to monitor our guidance that we have provided to them, you know, based upon the surveillance information we have at hand. Bruce Dupuis, Maryland. Guess, oh, yeah. Mr. County Executive. Yeah, I mean, I haven't, um, I haven't read everything the school systems proposed. I understand um, concerns about whether you know ventilation issues and other things have been adequately addressed. Or how many people are going to be in a classroom because you know as a former teacher if i had the regular size class in a regular size classroom i would never achieve the separation that people want so i'd want to look at you know how they are going to deal with the number of kids who are brought back into classrooms and i, th I think the big thing that gets lost in all of this is we talk about montgomery county as if montgomery county were all the same and the truth is, and this is one reason why we've been focused on equity issues, there are parts of the county that do really, really well. I mean, our positivity in cases per 100,000 is the total for the entire county. They are not evenly distributed across the county. You, I, you can look at zip codes, and we've got zip code maps, and you'll see far more cases and far more apparent transmission uh, per 100,000. And uh, you'll see other zip codes where you don't see many cases and you have you would then extrapolate much lower um, likelihood of transmission. So I understand that people would look at different neighborhoods and have different concerns about where you were teaching and what's the environment and what's the positivity rather than just looking at countywide numbers. I think there's something to be said for thinking about that. Thank you. Bruce Dupuy. Now on matters, you have a question for the county executive. Thank you. Uh, two, hopefully, quick questions. Uh, Mr. Executive, um, I, I was given some vaccination allocation numbers, county by county, that I haven't been able to verify yet, but they lead to a question, and that is, are the large counties getting their fair share? Uh, and the other question I would have is, do you know how many doses have come into your county to any uh, potential distribution point? In other words, you probably know what the health department gets. Do you know the universe of doses that have come in? Thank you. Um, out of my memory, no. <laughs> but I remember seeing charts that list um, what we're getting, what the hospitals are getting, and then generic number for pharmacies, but not each individual not each individual giant, not each individual Safeway. Um, the doses at the pharmacy level seem to be pretty low on a daily basis, so it doesn't surprise me that when they open up for scheduling, they close down really, really quickly because they, they're not major centers as, a, as individual pharmacies, so they do have a fair number of doses. Um, the hospitals have had varying numbers of doses. I know that the, uh, uh, I think, suburban or is it suburban what is it johns hopkins popped out at one point at about eight thousand doses and then they're back down in the i don't know the two or three thousand range travis or uh, dr stoddard can correct me on that but they have not had a, a steady supply i think what the governor would do is add up all the doses put together and take our percentage of the state population and tell us we're getting our proportionate share of what they are sharing with counties. Now, out of that, you'd have to take what they're sharing for these um, mass vaccination sites. And because they're state sites, um, and like in the case of Prince George's County, a ton of Montgomery County residents are getting vaccinated, they probably would not count them as a particular allocation to a county since they have a broader um, availability. But I think that, you know, if they do the numbers, depending how you look at the numbers, they're pretty close to our percentage of, of people. It doesn't take into account, for example, our percentage of cases and how deeply spread, you know, the virus was here. I mean, we still, I think, top the state in first or second in cases and uh, first in deaths, I think, over the time period. Thank you. Albert Myers, MMC TV. Albert? No? 
Okay, we'll move to Rebecca Tan from the Washington Post. Rebecca? Um, for Dr. Gales um, and Dr. Stoddard, what are the biggest challenges or the risks that could hamper the progress that we've made, you know, particularly in the past three weeks in terms of slowing the spread of the virus? And then I have another question after this. Uh, good afternoon, Rebecca. I think uh, the biggest concern is that when you still, as if, if you think back to some of our, our comments back from the, the mid to late summer in terms of reopening, when you still have elevated levels and, you know, we're looking at, you know, 107 cases and 13 cases per 100,000 as significant improvements from where we were a month ago when we were seeing 600 cases a day and, you know, the, the, the cases per 100,000 over 40 is they're still high. And they're still, by CDC definition, still meet high risk of transmission. And the concern is that when you have higher levels of community transmission, even though there are improvements, there's still pockets of the virus within the community. And certainly the presence of variant strains that are more contagious is that as you open things up, the quicker you do that and you open up more things and activities where you increase the number of people who are coming into contact with each other, it, there's there's kindling there to light the fire and have it spread faster. And so at least from the, the public health surveillance perspective, that's a huge concern for us. Dr. Stoddard? Yeah, I was gonna say, I think the one big thing that we're, so there's a couple things. I think, first off, um, let me start off by saying that we there, there's plenty of good reason to be optimistic about where we are in terms of not just the county, but the state, the country are moving in a, in a really good direction. Um, you know, with the number of people who've been infected, unfortunately, you know, the, 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 I guess the, 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 the bonus of that is that many of those people are likely to have some immunity moving forward. 15 to 30% of the country at this point, depending on how the metrics according to the CDC have probably likely been infected. That's nationwide data. You add in that, you know, we've, we've got 10.6% of people who have first doses that have been administered in the state of Maryland. We believe there's probably another 10 or so thousand who have received vaccinations through other states, other Virginia or DC. So we're probably 12 or 13 percent at all. Uh, and so you add those two numbers together and maybe, you know, something like a third of our county likely has some level of immunity to the COVID-19 virus, which is we're moving in the right direction. Now, as Dr. Gales alluded to, we have these variants that are out there, which um, we, have, we have every reason to believe we're going to take over and are more transmissible. And that's going to likely happen over a period of, let's say, the next uh, six to eight weeks. Um, and we just don't know what that does to our overall COVID situation. We have every reason to make, believe, you know, believe it, it presents some significant earlier risk. But the other big thing that we're really trying to combat is this sense of complacency, because obviously the numbers are getting better. People are seeing the numbers get better. And we want people to understand that the numbers are getting better because of the things that we've been doing, not as an incentive to go do a whole bunch of other things that are gonna make it much more risky. And so um, that's not to say that the county is going to stay, if our numbers continue like this, the county is not gonna stay as, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna open more things up, that will happen. But we're trying to be regimented about this. Obviously we just opened indoor dining on Sunday. We'd like to see how that impacts our numbers. We have, we're, we're trying to get our schools back into session, hopefully in March. We don't want to do anything to jeopardize that. We obviously want to see if there's any impact in that. So I think over the next few weeks, we're going to have this conversation repetitively. And I think you're going to see more actions taken on the county side as we see these numbers continue to go down. But we're trying to be uh, pragmatic about this and have it be uh, a regimented, uh, open something up, evaluate, right? open up something else, evaluate kind of thing where you're not just rushing to open everything up. Something bad happens, and then you can't you know, assert what the thing you was that you opened up that caused, you know, all, all your problems. Were. So we're just trying to be regimented about how we go through this. We are, we are encouraged by where we are at. There are reasons to be encouraged. There are reasons to have concerns about the future, but we're going to continue to evaluate that on a regular basis. Got it. And my, and my second question is sort of related to my first, which is, do you think the county will be approaching reopening this time around any differently than it did in the summer and the fall of 2020? And do you want to see the state or the region approach it any differently? Well, I think that, that's, that's a fair question. And I think, as I alluded to in my opening statement, is that moving forward, there may be some activities, again, that if they're open or reopen in some capacity, there may be some different parameters within which those, those opportunities can, can happen. You know, I think, of, for example, 
uh, you know, sporting activities where, you know, in the early stages they were allowed, you know, folks were not required to wear face coverings. And we saw that pop up in, you know, significant pockets of transmission, particularly with youth, youth sports. You know, potentially moving forward, if those opportunities are opened up again, uh, there may be, you know, tighter requirements around that, you know, to mitigate, you know, transmission from person to person. So I would say those are the types of things that, you know, we're continuing to think through, again, as we have more evidence about the potential risks that are associated with different activities, particularly more data points in terms of how the virus may be transmitted during those spaces. Um, that, again, if they are allowed or reopened, if you will, there may be some tighter restrictions around that in order for those activities to move forward. I would also add, I think the one big thing too is obviously we have some more tools in the toolbox of where we're at than we did when we op reopened even last early, you know, late last uh, spring, early summer. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, is that not only do not we think about vaccination as a tool, but we really weren't testing at the level that we are capable of testing at now back then. And so we can connect, for example, more testing requirements to events because we're offering enough testing to allow that to be a a component of it. And so obviously that's something that's being discussed in the context of the schools, but also like if you, you could theoretically have events where you said, you know, we could, we could, we could look at letters of approval, for example, where there was a testing component to allow it to happen. And so there are just more tools that we have available to us that will allow us to be a bit more, a um, bit, bit more uh, confident in things that we're allowing to move forward being uh, as well developed. And, and, and frankly, we've seen events that have worked. I think that's one of the big things is we, we've tried some different things. We've seen some things that did not work. We've seen some things that did work. And obviously that will inform how we, um, you know, we set requirements or even uh, guidelines for how things will reopen in the future. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Dominic Bonesi with WAMU with two questions. Dominic. Hi, County Executive and Dr. Gales and Dr. Stoddard. Um, I have two, one short one and one longer one, so I'll do my short one first. The county, just to be clear, the county is currently in, in phase of vaccination, phase 1A and 1B. Is that correct? So we're- the County Health Clinic. The, county the Health county. Clinic, correct. County, the state and, and the pharmacies and the other uh, hospitals are in phase 1C. That's correct. I, okay. So, um, I'm just kind of curious, how do you weigh telling teachers under 75 years old to get vaccinated before they return to in-person learning and teachers having to go to other places other than the county health department to get vaccinated with sort of the number of vaccines that you're seeing right now? Well, from a health perspective and distribution perspective, it's a question of numbers. And so, you know, we are trying to encourage folks to use as many outlets that are available that they have access to to be able to get the vaccine um you know and, and encouraging and emphasizing the importance of it um right now again the challenge we have with the <clears throat> amount of doses that we receive 4500 a week we're trying to get <laughs> 78,000 individuals who are over the age of 75 vaccinated. We've only, you know, with our efforts and with others, we're at 50% of that. We also recognize that, you know, included in that, we've got teachers, we've got childcare workers, we've got a whole list of other essential employees who requested to, for, you know, consideration as well to be included in that. And so it's just a simple numbers game. And so that's why we are recognizing our efforts to prioritize the, the older population, but encouraging, for example, we've, if you think back to several weeks ago, part, well, not partnering, but helping provide guidance to some of those agencies who are outside of the county operation who are receiving doses to encourage uh, forming partnerships with educators from public and non-public schools to be able to offer that mm -hmm. coverage. Uh, so it's a dicey situation where, again, we recognize the safety parameters. And again, as a health provider, I still encourage uh, educators to have access to the vaccine uh, and as part of going back. Um, but, you know, it's, it's simply a numbers game in terms of the resources we have available to put out. Unfortunately, again, at this point, based upon the allotment of doses that we receive, it is a, you know, 4,500 doses can only go so far. And so I would say that 
Um, that's that's the unfortunate situation where we're in, uh, and we're continuing when we find out new opportunities and have an opportunity to provide guidance to those entities. We are encouraging them to reach out and form those partnerships to increase access to the vaccine to those key cohorts of population that you just mentioned. Right now, I think for, you know, obviously for MCPS specifically, there are approximately 9,000 employees that they've identified as being needed for their phase one reopening, which is the March 15th opening. Uh, based on our most recent reports from the partnership with Johns Hopkins, they've been offered approximately 6,000 appointments to cover that 9,000 employees so far. Obviously, we're a little less than a month away from now, that March 15th deadline, and have a, you know, that means we have several more weeks to get vaccines in arms. And I expect that uh, given given this, given the current uh, uh, pacing that, you know, we'll certainly have just about all the 9,000 with a, with, a, with a shot in the arm by that period of time. Um, and obviously we're hopeful from a county perspective, we're about halfway through the 75 plus population. The next tier does include educators after we move beyond that 75 and older tier. And there's, we have every reason to believe that over the next few weeks, several weeks maybe, we'll be able to move into that tier and add to what the Hopkins partnership is doing already. And so um, we think there, we think there were, we're not off of pace from that goal of having at least one shot in the arm for our teachers before that 15th deadline. And, um, you know, we're, we're comfortably moving forward with it now. I'm sorry, but there are students, there are some schools returning to school on March 1st. Am I, am I mistaken? There are, and I believe that uh, Hopkins, or not, uh, I believe that MCPS did prioritize many of those uh, March 1st educators in their first cadre in that 6,000 that have already been offered. Um, certainly, uh, we'll be having conversations with them to verify that, but obviously, I didn't even think for that March 1st timeline. It is a smaller number than 9,000 for that March 1st timeline, just, just so we're clear. Much smaller. Okay, next question. Uh, thank you. Uh, Rosberry Quinones with Univision of Washington. Two questions. Have you seen improvement in the registration, pre registration rates among Hispanics? And is the county considering opening vaccination centers in Hispanic communities? Would like to take that question those questions i'll answer the second one yes so part of our effort in reaching out to form partnerships with community um, entities is to identify uh, venues that are in, in zip codes that have had a high volume uh, of impact from covid related to cases as well as fatalities as well as um, venues location from housing sites to community sites where we do see a high percentage of those communities, however you define them, uh, related to those who've been disproportionately impacted by COVID. So we are, um, as you can see, I'm in the command center today. We've been working on a host of different strategies to try to address that uh, and hope to be able to announce some opportunities in the very near future. And question But also one. say one more, one more point on that. So looking at the demographics, and you can actually find this on our website now, we did launch our vaccine dashboard. You can find that on there. If you click on the 75 and older population, it will actually give you a uh, racial and ethnic demographic breakdown of our 75 and older population. And, and we, we're definitely making some positive, this is the area where the, obviously the, the health department is focused in that 75 and older population and using an equity lens there. We are actually seeing that the rates of, um, uh, of our Hispanic residents, Latino uh, residents is improving in that group where we are trying to make that influence. Uh, we have more work to we have more to go, but obviously the numbers in the 75 and older population look much more like Montgomery County than some of our age other age groups do, and that's because we've applied an equity lens to our to our uh, clinics in a way that some of the other clinics across the state have not. And so we feel like as we move into different categories, we'll be able to we'll be able to you know make that influence. Uh, um, more broadly over additional age categories as we move into our further tiers of vaccination. Jeff Moore with WTOP. Questions for the three of you gentlemen. Jack? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great. I think Dr. Gales uh, mentioned this figure, but I just want to uh, make, make uh, sure I'm understanding. 50% <clears throat> Uh, of the 75 and older population and the total population is 78,000. Is that correct? Yes, we estimate somewhere based on the 2019 census numbers. And is there, um, 
uh, kind of another way of looking at the de denominator, what about the number of 75 plus pre-registered? Do you have that figure readily available? I, I don't, but it, the number is, it was in, I believe, almost 90,000. We have not fully <clears throat> duplicated that number yet, so we know that there's multiple registrations. So, for example, we, 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 we know of, of county employees who, who have registered their parents and each of the each of the children did it, you know. So there's three different registrations for the same person. So we have to we're actually ha we we actually develop had to develop a program in our Department of Technology and Services uh, to to deduplicate some of these, and so we're looking for a better number. Um, but um, yeah, I think that's sort of where we're at. And I think I know the answer, but you know, you're nearing 50% now. You say you want to get a little further into that. Is there a when you reach a certain percentage, then you will move to the next phase? I think the expectation is it's not necessarily that we have a magical percentage that we want to hit before we move forward. We want to make sure that everybody who's in that category has had a chance to register for an appointment, uh, whether it's through our site or other sites before we move forward. Uh, because we, you know, we recognize that much like the approach we took in uh, vaccinating those in the 1A category, we're likely not going to achieve 100% before we move forward. But we want to make sure that everyone at least has opportunity to to get access, and then you know include bringing others, as, and so we can keep the the pendulum moving. Yeah. So the, you know, as the as as Dr. Gales and the public health team send out invites, as you start to see the slots slow, or the, the rate at which those slots are filled start to slow down that's when you start to have the conversation about in, uh, of including additional groups into it. And so it's sort of just like I think the governor said, you know, just like you're boarding an airplane as that line starts to get down a little bit, you're not seeing other people line up, you start to bring in other groups to fill that line out. Thank you. And one more quick question um, for the county executive or maybe Dr. Gales. Um, uh, county executive, I know you spoke about the certainty of doses. Um, and I believe the state had sent out a bulletin saying that basically through March 8th, the county health department, according to their projections, will receive 4,500 doses. So will you be able to plan longer term or do you still need also those fixes on the appointment links that, this, that the state really have to make? So that'll, that'll let us plan up until that's no longer the guarantee. I mean, the week after that, if I don't know I have 4,500 doses, I cannot now plan um, that week for 4,500 appointments. So we'll plan as far as we can plan, um, assuming the registration, they get their, <laughs> their uh, scheduling system fixed, but assuming they get that fixed, we'll plan as far out as we know we're gonna have doses for. I mean, before they did the 4,500 for three weeks, we were previously told we could get 900, we'd get 900 and so that was our guarantee. 975 people a week was like one fifth of the doses we were getting, which means that we could only schedule one fifth of the people. I'd schedule people out two, three, four weeks and then 975 and they would automatically have to wait even if I could have moved them forward in the beginning. So we, we need a regular commitment. I'm glad they gave us, they're committed for three weeks. I hope every week they revise the next, the out weeks numbers so that maybe after the third week they can either tell us the fourth week's going to be 4,500 or maybe there's enough vaccine around that it'll be 6,000. But if we need numbers enough in advance we can actually schedule to fill the slots. So yes, it, having the, to add to what the county executive mentioned, yes, it does help knowing those allotments. It does allow us to plan uh, as well as, you know, be able to figure out how we can explore partnerships in the community, as well as provide vaccine to our larger sites that we have available to our residents. The fix in the system, the registration system is key because that will allow us to feel comfortable and confident when we send a link out to these appointments that they are going to the people who actually are eligible for them. You can imagine the situation where we, if we're planning clinics out for a month and we send out a link and people are sending Sending it out to everybody else and it's spreading through the community, lots of those appointments could potentially be locked up by people who aren't eligible, again, blocking those who were trying to get through the queue faster and quicker so that we can move to the other prioritization groups. Thank you. Max is Brianna Arikusuma from Bethesda Beat, and she has a question for Dr. Gales. Brianna. 
Thanks. Um, before I ask my question, I just had a quick clarification about what you just said, Dr. Gales. Um, is the link just going to be a one-use link, or is it something that only the person who has it will be able to use? So let's say someone receives the unique link and they send it to someone before they register. Is it possible that that person could use that link to register themselves? Uh, I believe so. It's a it's so it's a one time live link that you can click on and register. And once that link has been used to register, it's not live anymore. So uh, and forgive me if I'm misspeaking. So it it one it helps decrease forwarding and after being used. But you're right. It also creates the parameter and hopefully discourages an individual from sending it to other people, running the risk that they may miss out on their opportunity to register because they've sent it to someone else who did it first. Right. Great. Thank you. Um, so can you explain how doses are allocated to residents ages 75 and older? I've had a lot of residents who have emailed me who are over 80 um, who said that they have pre-registered close to the beginning of when pre-registration opened for that group. Um, is it first come, first serve with that group, or are you prioritizing by age within that group? So it's not first come, first serve. Uh, there's a host of factors that if you think back to actually the last two briefings we had, Dr. Kroll laid out the factors that we've been looking at, you know, from an equity perspective, you know, thinking about, um, you know, uh, geographic location, zip codes, uh, to some degree race and ethnicity, to some degree age as well. Uh, but really taking a look at those factors that have been clearly tied to having a higher risk of exposure to COVID-19 um, as factors to also think about how those doses are allocated within the community. Now, we did uh, this week uh, make an effort to as we've continued to move through and to try to prioritize, we did make a decision to say, okay, everyone who's a centenarian in the county, we, you know, here's a link to the appointment to try to, you know, bring again, you know, to start thinking about age to some degree within that. But, you know, just as a, to, to go back to it's the, the approach from equity is consistent at using the data that we found throughout the pandemic of those particular factors that increase risk within that age cohort, such as location, zip, so geographic location, race and ethnicity are the kind of factors that are looked at in terms of how those doses are allotted. Do you have any updated estimated timeline of when you expect to have 75 and older completed? No, not at this time. Okay. We're trying to you know, get it through quickly as, as quickly as we can. Okay. I think the best we can say is I think at this time last week we were at approximately 36%. And so we've done about, I say we, this is the, this is like, this is everyone in Montgomery County who's going to a site or something like that. Um, we did about 12% of that population. So, <clears throat> you know, I, like, I, I, we, and the thing is, is as Dr. Giles alluded to, we don't know exactly what, at what point, we know there's some people who are not going to want to take the vaccine, even among the 75 older population. We just don't know what that exact number is going to be. So we're planning for it to be 100%, but, but uh, and everyone will get an offer for a slot before we move into the next group. But will that offer, you know, will we will we not fill slots fast enough and make all those offers in two weeks or is it three weeks or four weeks? That's I think it's probably the range that we're talking about, but I think we're not sure whether it's gonna be two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. Right, and to clarify, the nearly, or the 43% of 75 and older, that's everyone, not just the County Health Department, correct? It's 48.6% it's and it's everyone. It's all yes. calls, any site. Okay, thank you. And the last thing I would say, I forgot to mention this earlier, is this underscores why we are prioritizing trying to get out into the community aggressively to try to find folks, you know, where they are to get to drive this number down as quickly as we can so that we can move to the next phase. Because we are concerned that there are those who are over 75 for whatever reason haven't pre-registered in the system and we're missing them. And we want to, you know, try to figure out how we can get them covered as quickly as we can, you know, to address all of those particular issues that have been discussed on the call, um, you know, to get the penetration in that community so that we can move forward to the next phase within that. Great, thank and you. Speaking of that, um, the other thing I want to highlight is because there's weather tomorrow, potentially tomorrow, and we haven't announced our decision yet, as you can see, people are walking behind me, everybody's trying to work through that, is if there are concerns about missing an appointment tomorrow due to weather, please contact us and let us know 
so that we can, you know, reschedule uh, those appointments. We recognize that, um, again, we haven't announced an official decision in the event that things are open tomorrow, which is a good chance it won't be, but in the event that they are, uh, we want folks to understand, we don't want, to comp want them to compromise their personal and family safety to get a vaccine, we will work with them to reschedule. But again, that's in the event if things are open tomorrow and there's no other contingency plan in place. Great, thank you. Thank you, Dr. And if things are closed, we'll, we're going to reschedule you too, just so you're, you know, you're not, you don't lose your spot. Okay. Um, that is the end of the reporter's questions, but there is one more question here on the chat from a county um, resident, apparently. Why is the state pushing against providing Montgomery County with a mass vaccination site given the size of the population? <laughs> an excellent question. Well, I'm not sure we, yeah, we have a great have answer. Call, yeah, I think you'd have to call the governor's office to get an answer on that one. I think the one, they've indicated that they believe that the Prince George's County site is sufficient to address both Montgomery County and Prince George's County. We vehemently disagree with that stance. Um, obviously, the, in the city of Baltimore, there now will be two sites, and um, you know, while we support our, our uh, neighbors in Baltimore City being well covered in vaccination, both you know, from an equity standpoint and every other reason, we obviously want to see that the county residents are are have an opportunity as well, and would like we. I mean, we're actually working with some potential locations in the county to, you know, get all of their, you know, the basics of like how much power they have coming in and how, where we would put restrooms and where we would, you know, what the flow would be so that we can give those strategies to the state to say, hey, we've done some of the work, leg work for you. I think this site is a very good one for doing X amount of vaccine and we're very happy to help support such an effort. And so I think it really is about, um, we, we continue to advocate to the state that we do have a mass vaccination site in Montgomery County that we believe can serve not just Montgomery County, uh, but our neighbors to the north and, and Carroll and Frederick and potentially even Howard counties could also uh, take advantage of a North County site in Montgomery County as well. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we're about done for today. Uh, no more questions. We'll see you then next week. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. Stay safe. Thank, thank you. you.